Hello, welcome to our video on the conventions of engineering documents. In the book, Communication Patterns of Engineers, Carol Tenoper and Donald King talk about how engineers spend more time outputting information than they do inputting information. In other words, they spend more time trying to communicate what they know than they do learning more material. That's even when it comes to research and design activities. According to several different studies, engineers spend between 45% to 75% of their time communicating. Now we're not just talking about writing here, we're talking about all kinds of communication. We're talking about face-to-face -face meetings, phone calls, we're talking about reports, emails, proposals, progress reports, talking to someone in the cubicle next door, whatever it is, we spend a lot of time communicating. It's all communication. But how does communication take place? Well, let's go to a different video. But communication works like this. I'm thinking of a blue car. I want someone else to be thinking about the same blue car. So if I'm thinking about a Volkswagen Beetle, and my audience is thinking about a Maserati, well, there's a disconnect there. I have not communicated it. So I want them to have the same Blue Beetle in their head. How do I cause that communication to happen? I have to use the means at my disposal. It can be writing. It can be talking. It can be gestures. But I want to communicate. It can be whatever I choose, whatever is most appropriate for communicating with that audience. I want the same idea in my head to be in my audience's head. So there are lots of problems that can happen between transmitting this idea. I wish I were a Vulcan, that I could just do a Vulcan mind meld and have someone understand what I'm trying to say. But I'm not, so I have to use these other things. And there's too many problems. Think about using the wrong language. Is this person going to understand you? Think about using incorrect grammar that makes, makes a sentence say something differently. Person going to understand you? We've got to follow the conventions to be able to communicate. So the goal of courses in, in communication is try to eliminate all that, those problems, that noise that gets in between me having the blue car and the audience having the blue car in their head. So we want to eliminate all the distractions, all the noise between those. Now one of the problems in engineering is conventions. Engineering is conventional. There are conventions for lab reports, there are conventions for emails, there are conventions for proposals, progress reports, there are conventions for every kind of document that we write. And if we don't follow those conventions, then the engineer who's reading it may not understand it fully. We may not successfully communicate. Consider the story of the laser, for instance. Gordon Gould was a young researcher. He was working on a PhD in physics from Columbia University. His advisor was Polycarp Kutch, but he also had another professor whose name was Charles Towns. Charles Towns had invented the maser, or microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Gould figured out that visible light could be amplified in a similar way. And his re he recorded his analysis in his notebook under the heading, Some Rough Calculations on the Feasibility of a Laser, Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. He knew it was a big deal. So he took his lab notebook, he took it to a candy store where a notary public worked, and he had the notary public sign it. So that's Gordon Gould. But Charles Towns and another researcher were also working on the same thing. But whose name is associated with the laser? Is it Gordon Gould or Charles Towns? Well, you may not know. It's Charles Towns. Charles Towns' name is associated with the laser. Sure, we call it a laser, which is a term developed by Gould. So how is it possible that Charles Towns is the one associated with the device if he didn't come up with the name and it's questionable about whether he came up with it first? Well, first there are the conventions. Gould should first of all have had another physicist sign his lab notebook. He should not have taken it to a general notary public. The conventions say another researcher is supposed to sign the lab notebook. It could have solved the problems that he eventually had if he had followed this convention. Second, Gould should have filed for his patent right away. What Gould did is he tried to develop a prototype first. He came up with the idea and then he tried to develop a prototype before he applied for a patent. He didn't realize you could apply for a patent before you really figured out if it worked. Charles Towns and his colleague, they went ahead and filed a patent. 
So who got the patent first? Well, it was Charles Towns, even though he didn't have a prototype. So make no mistake, not following the simplest of conventions can have huge ramifications. These lawsuits between Towns and Gould have been going on since the development. It's only recently that Gould has been able to get any money out of it, even though he developed the laser. So the conventions are there for a reason. They can make a difference. Consider the reader of a proposal. The National Science Foundation, NSF, has a proposal guide that's about 71 pages long. It guides the writer of proposals through writing the proposal. Why do they need to follow those conventions? Well, I was talking to someone who applies for NSF grants, and he said that when he writes proposals, he would get kind of upset that he had to what seemed like repeat information in different places. The proposal can only be 15 pages long. He end up repeating information because they ask for it in three different places. And that always upset him. He thought, why? Why do I need to do this? I'm wasting my valuable time and space. Well, when he became a reviewer, he realized why. It's because the reviewer doesn't actually read every word. The reviewer looks for key things in key places. The reviewer knows where the information is supposed to be because they're all following the same conventions. If they don't follow those conventions, if they don't put the material in these places, then the reader may not catch it. It makes it more difficult for the reader to understand what's going on. Follow the conventions and then it communicates well. But if the person doesn't follow the conventions, then the reader has trouble understanding it. So engineering documents are conventional because they help us find information easily. We don't generally read every single word of any report. We find the sections we need or we know where the information is. So any progress report, I should be able to pick up any progress report and get the information I need. I know where the information is going to be because every progress report follows the same format. If there's one that does not follow the same format, then I'm wondering, well, where's the information? Follow the conventions and your reader won't get lost because your reader knows the conventions as well. So most scientific technical articles or reports follow what we call the IMRD format. That's I, introduction, M, methodology, R, results, D, discussion. Now sometimes they'll be called something different. Sometimes it may be called experimental process instead of methodology. Sometimes it may be just discussion without a separate results section. Say, sometimes it may be called results and discussion. Whatever it is, it generally follows that format. And that format also follows the tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them format. So the introduction answers some basic questions. It's the tell them what you're gonna tell them. It sets up the purpose of the document, the problem that it's trying to solve, that the experiment is solving or the design is solving. It also lets the reader know what the rest of the document is going to contain. It's the tell them what you're going to tell them part. And then the methodology results discussion, that's the tell them part. So you've got the tell them what you're going to tell them and then tell them. Then the conclusion generally summarizes and makes some further recommendations. That's the tell them what you told them part. So IMRD and tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. Introduction, methodology, results, discussion. Just to keep it clear. But those are just organizational conventions. What about writing conventions? Engineering has those too. To find out, let's look at an example from Charles Dickens, one of the great 19th century writers from one of his most popular novels and my mom's favorite book, A Tale of Two Cities. The two cities are London and Paris and is during the time of the French Revolution. So this is in the 1790s. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. So, what do we make of this passage? Yes, you there, but what do you think? Eh, it sucks. Yes, it sucks, sure, but, but why? Well, it's a run-on. Okay, good can't just join independent clauses with a comma. My fifth grade teacher taught me that that was called a comma splice. 
Okay, good, yes, so it's, it's a type of run-on called a comma splice, but why does Charles Dickens get away with this and your fifth grade teacher wouldn't let you do it? Well, because he's Charles Dickens, of course, he can do whatever he wants. Okay, good, so there are some privileges to being a famous author. But let's think about what this passage is communicating. What is it actually saying? It sucks. Yes, we already established the fact that it sucks. But what is it trying to communicate to the audience? Well, it finally says the point near the end. It's that the time that he's writing about is similar to the present time when he's actually writing. And so everyone always thinks that each point in time is specific and unique, but really they're all just kind of alike. Everyone always thinks that they're the best and the worst. Excellent. So the main point is embedded near the end of the passage. So what is the rest of the passage doing? Why is it there? It sucks. Yes, I know. It sucks. Okay, great. But what is the rest of the writing doing? It exemplifies or amplifies the main point. It adds to it. It makes it more important. Makes it sound good. Okay, but could the rest of the passage have said simply, the French Revolution was just like any other point in human history. Would, would that be clearer and more precise? Well, yes, but then it wouldn't be Charles Dickens. Okay, good. So there's something about literary writing that makes the writing itself stand out. It could be written more precise, more concise, but then it might not be as literary. So literary writing makes the writing itself important. It may be flowery language. What it's doing is it's calling attention to itself as writing. Contrast that with this passage. Particles of post-consumer plastics were used in lieu of a portion of the coarse aggregates. These grains were produced by chopping up larger pieces to reduce their size. No specific type of plastic was dominant. The particle size and shape of plastics varied widely. Some particles were long and string-like, and others resembled small rocks. Using a random sample, a sea of analysis was completed on the gradation of the plastics. They were found to be poorly graded. What do you think of this one? Uh, I, I don't get it. No, I like it. Really? Now, what do you like about this one? There's nothing superfluous. It says exactly what it wants to say, and it communicates to several different pieces of information really quickly and concisely. That's the way I talk. Like when you said, A Tale of Two Cities sucks, right? Exactly. Those two words, they said everything there is to say about A Tale of Two Cities. Clear and concise. That's me. And that's definitely engineering writing. Try this example. Chad got off the bus and looked down the street to his house. It was only about 50 yards and he figured he could get in, make the sandwich, and get out again within about five minutes. There was no way he was going to skip the sandwich though. He knew that. It wasn't just a couple of slices of bread and some condiments. No, no, it was much more than that. It was a way of life. A way to make sense of his own existence. He was one of the components, but he had yet to figure out whether he was the sweetness, the saltiness, or the caps that made them stick together. He took off at a jog and raced into the house. Oh, oh, I like it. The, the protagonist is looking at the peanut butter and jelly as a metaphor for life and how difficult life is and the contradictions in it. And all the while, he's trying to figure out where he fits into it, even though he embraces it. He loves those contradictions, but he just can't seem to find where he fits. Okay, okay, well, how about this? There are four primary steps to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. First, the engineer will remove two slices of bread from the plastic bag or other container. Sometimes bread is stored in paper or special plastic containers that allow some air circulation. Either way, the engineer shall remove two slices. Then the jelly should be spread onto one of the slices. Peanut butter should be spread onto the other slice. The amounts of jelly and peanut butter are dependent on the person's taste and should not be dictated by any other factor. The engineer should be aware, however, that too much jelly may make the bread soggy. 
Lastly, the engineer should put the two slices of bread together with the peanut butter and jelly sides facing one another to form the sandwich. Well, some of it is good. I like the little points about not putting too much jelly and how it should be done according to taste. Nah, it isn't necessary. Cut out all that fluff, unimportant stuff, and then you'll have some instructions. Sheesh. Like this one? There are four primary steps to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. One, remove two slices of bread. Two, spread jelly on one slice. Three, spread peanut butter on the other slice. Four, place slices of bread together with jelly and peanut butter sides facing one another. Five, eat. Yeah, exactly. So we can pull out a few ways that engineering writing is different from this other kind of literary writing. So here is a table that lists some of the differences between technical writing or engineering writing or science writing and general academic writing, which we can also call expository or persuasive writing, as well as creative writing. Now, I've tried to delineate some of the differences between these three. The purpose of technical writing is usually to inform or instruct, while general academic writing wants to persuade or argue. While creative writing is generally there to entertain, and those purposes determine the content, format, and style. For example, if what you want to do is inform or instruct, then you want to be very factual and straightforward in your content. While in creative writing, because you want to entertain, then the language, itself, the content is imaginative or metaphoric, um, which helps to entertain you because it's interesting metaphors, interesting relationships that that is entertaining. Now the format of technical writing, let's say the standard documents, proposals, progress reports, technical reports, they do follow that IMRD format. Here I've got introduction with methodology results and conclusions. A general academic writing may have no set format, but it does usually follow thesis, reasons, and evidence. That's how we lay out an argument. We persuade people by having a thesis and then supporting that with reasons and then giving evidence for that. Uh, the technical writing often has that included. So we have a hypothesis with methodology with results. Um, the format of creative writing, there is no set format because it's wanting to entertain, it can do whatever it wants. Now, we sometimes hear that a story should have beginning, middle, and end. While it's true that most good stories, things that we enjoy, do have beginning, middle, and end, the, the format can be very different. So sometimes uh, the end is at the beginning. Watch, watch Reservoir Dogs, for example. Watch Pulp Fiction. The, it begins with the ending. Now, the style of these three types of writing are very different as well. The writing of technical writing, because it's to inform and stuck, it's very factual, straightforward. The writing is often very simple, uses declarative sentences, uses concise sentences and paragraphs. Sometimes paragraphs will only be two or three sentences long. It does not use the personal. It does not have personal feelings, personal pronouns, personal judgments. It's very formal. There are clear topic sentences. The vocabulary is generally specialized although some of that vocabulary must be explained. Now, for general academic writing, the writing may draw some attention to itself. What I mean there is the difference between the tale of two cities and the technical writing that we looked at. It's not quite as far as creative writing. Part of what entertains us about creative writing is that the writing itself is creative. The writing is the important part. We are entertained by the writing. So there may be long sentences for effect, like that tale of two cities. There may be narrators, characters, personal judgments of the narrators. Sometimes the author may enter in. It's generally informal, very figurative language. There's no clear topic sentences, usually. 
Sometimes a paragraph will skip from one thing to the next. Sometimes a paragraph will only be a couple words. The vocabulary can be all over the place. So contrast creative writing with technical writing, and you see the two poles of this. Technical writing is very conventional. It's very simple. The writing does not call any attention to itself because that's not the point. The point is to inform or instruct. So the conventions for engineering documents, both the organization and the writing, are there for a reason. They're there to save time so that we don't have to read through the whole thing. We can find the information we need quickly. And they're there so that it's precise and concise. It says what it wants to say, and it says it without any extra words. But remember that conventions are there for the author, too. The author knows exactly what to write in any given document because he knows the conventions. So when you write a progress report, for example, if you don't include a tasks completed section, then you're telling your audience either, one, you have no progress to report, two, you have progress but you chose to report it for some reason, or three, you don't know what you're doing and you didn't know you were supposed to communicate progress. Part of your goal is to be credible. Following the conventions helps show that you are part of that community. You know engineering because you know the conventions of engineering documents. That makes you appear credible. Sure, is it a facade? Well, maybe, kind of, but it does show that you are a part of knowing the engineering conventions. And that's important. It gives you credibility. So what are the conventions? Well, there are lots of them. Some of them may appear silly, such as rules about pagination. Rules say that the introduction always begins on Arabic numeral one. So all the front matter, everything before it, should be paginated in lower Roman case numerals. So the title page never gets a page number, but it's counted as page one, even though it doesn't have a page number on it. So the little Roman numeral two will start with the table of contents, and then the list of figures, list of tables, abstract, whatever else is in that front matter. Then the introduction always starts with, starts with Arabic numeral one. Sure, there's a purpose for doing it that way, but can you still understand it, even though the introduction starts on page four? Can you understand what it's trying to say? Yeah. But anything that makes the reader pause, any deviance from the conventions, means that there's a disconnect. The reader pauses, and so they're not right with you. It means there's a disconnect between what the message that is trying to be conveyed and the person who's trying to understand that message. If I see a document that starts on page four, I start to have questions. Why does it start on page four? What, what happened to the other three pages? Were there three other pages? Did they get lost? Did they not transmit correctly? Did I happen to rip them off? Did I miss something? Did the person just choose to do it this way? Does, does that person not know the convention? When I'm busy having those thoughts, I'm no longer concentrating on what's in the document. And that means I'm not understanding fully.